Look at verse 10. There was a famine in the land. Who's writing this? Moses is writing it. Who's he writing it for? Well, he's writing it for us, ultimately. But initially, he's writing it for the children of Israel who are in transit in the desert. Who led them to the desert? God led them to the desert. What was their first problem in the desert? They didn't have anything to eat. Now here's the question. Is this blessing? God leads him, God promises a blessing, and then he leads him to a place where there's famine. Luther said this. God always gives a man, God always gives a woman, a reason to cry out to him. Maybe you see a man who's very rich. Maybe you're very poor. Let me tell you something. You may not know it, but that man has a reason to cry out to God. You may see a man or a woman with a great family. Maybe you don't have a family, or maybe you've got difficulties in your family. Let me tell you something. That person with a great family, they have reason to cry out to God. You may see someone with great health. Maybe you don't have great health. Maybe you struggle and you struggle mightily. Let me tell you something. That person with great health, that person has a reason to cry out to God. Abram had everything he wanted. He was rich, but God brings him to a place of famine. God brings him to a place where he has to cry out to God for food. Well, God wants to bring us to a place of dependence on Him. And this is a really hard thing for a man to understand. It's much easier for a woman. Everything that a man does, every natural instinct that a man has, every effort that a man makes is to get him to a position where he's not dependent. That's why a man works. That's why a man saves. That's why a man makes choices. He's trying to achieve independence. But you know what? God is bringing us to a place of dependence on Him. When we read 2 Corinthians verse 12, we see that God makes His strength to shine through weakness. So, if dependence is the objective, then weakness is the advantage. Abraham had everything, and now God brings him to a place where he has to cry out to him. You know, Jesus went out with his disciples in a boat, and when they got on that boat and they went with him, there was a storm. How could a storm happen if they were in the will of God. Were they in the will of God? Yes. Were they in the place where God wanted them to be? Were they going where God wanted them to go? Yes. Then why is there a storm? Because that's part of God's will too. Um, Joseph takes Mary. He makes her his wife, or at least his fiance, and he starts taking care of her. They've got to go to Bethlehem. Is it God's will for them to go to Bethlehem? Yes. But she's going to have a baby, and there's no place to stay. She's having a baby, and she doesn't have a place to stay. Wouldn't you think that if it was God's will, there would have been room in the inn for them? Wouldn't you think that if God really loved them and really cared about them, that they, she would have had a place to deliver her firstborn child? Did God love them? Did God care about them? God cared about them more than He cared about anybody. Because that's not only Mary's son being born. That's God's son being born. Don't test God. Don't put God to your test. Don't tell God, well, if you really cared about me, this would be different. 
Did God love Abram? Did God care about him? Yes. Then why did he lead him to a place of famine? To teach him dependence. To teach him to cry out to God. Now, did Abram pass the test? Well, no, not exactly. Not exactly. This is one of the most amazing stories in the Bible, and it happens twice in the book of Genesis. Actually, it happens three times because it also happens with Isaac. It says in, in Genesis 12, verse 10, now, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram, in what land? In the land that God showed Abram, in the land that God took Abram to. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. So he leaves Canaan and he goes to Egypt. Now, um, who's Moses writing this to? He's writing this to, to a group of people who've just left Egypt. Now he's telling them that their patriarch, their first father, the first father of the Hebrew tribe, the Hebrew nation, he leaves Canaan to go to Egypt. He goes backwards. Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Now here's a question. Should he have stayed in Canaan and stayed out of Egypt and allowed God to provide for him in Canaan? Well, I, this is a question like the question, should he have taken his father with him? Should he have taken his son with him? And the answer to that question is, I don't know. But I think it's possible that he should have stayed in Canaan and waited on the Lord. The story of Abram is not the story of a perfect man. The story of Abram is the story of a faithful man. God does not make a man or a woman fault, faultless, that is, without fault. You know what I mean when I say faultless? That means without fault, without sin. God does not make a man faultless at every moment. God makes a man or a woman faithful at everlasting moments. Now, when Abram gets to Egypt, he does something that's not faithful. And it's going to take us a long time to get to chapter 22. And probably we're not going to get to chapter 22 until I come back to your country later. But I will tell you this. What happens in chapter 12 is connected with chapter 22. But we're going to have to wait to talk about it. Here's what happens. And here's another amazing thing. They come to Egypt. And Abraham says to his wife, you are one good-looking babe. Now, that's great that a man who's 75 years old can say that to a woman who's 65 years old. And let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about that for a minute. How is that possible? Now, is it possible for a woman to be 65 years old and to be really good looking. Yes, that is possible. Even in our generation, of course it's possible. But is it possible in our generation for a woman to be 65 years old to be so good looking that a king who had a harem, who had lots of other good looking women, would actually kill somebody so he could take her into his harem? Probably not. It's certainly possible for a woman to be in her mid-60s and still be really beautiful. But it's probably not going to happen that a man who can have lots and lots and lots of beautiful women would kill so he could have a woman in her 60s. Why would he do that when he could have a woman in her teens or in her 20s or in her 30s? Well, remember that even though people are not living as long as they lived before the flood, Remember that her father-in-law lived to be 200, over 200 years old, 205 years old. Now, she herself lived to be over 120 years old. I think she was like 127 when she died, 126. I don't remember exactly. I'll look it up in just a minute. One thing that's really significant about that is that Sarah... She was 127, Genesis 23, 1. Um, Sarah is the only woman in the Bible 
whose age is given at death. 127. Well, here's what that means. When she was 65 years old, she still had 62 years to live. So when you think about her beauty, I want you to remember two things. Don't think of a woman who's 65 years old. Or don't think of a woman who was 90 years old when it happens again in chapter 20. Think of a woman who has 62 years left to live. Can a woman who has 62 years left to live be really, really good looking? You bet she can. Can a woman who has 62 years to live be so good looking that a king would kill to make her one of his wives? You bet. So think of it that way. But there's something else going on here. Remember, God has His hand on this couple. Remember, this is a supernatural story. I believe it's also possible that her beauty was supernatural. And I believe it's also possible that when God said to Abram, I want you to pretend you're on your honeymoon until I give you a child, I believe that Abram could have thought, that'll be easy. With a woman like that, with a woman who looks like her, that's a wonderful, wonderful assignment. So I believe that her supernaturally preserved beauty at an, at an age which would be advanced in our generation was a gift that God was giving to her husband. But her husband's not a very good steward of that gift when he gets to Egypt. Her husband gets scared and he says, you're so good looking that I'm afraid the men down here are going to kill me so they can have you. And so Abram comes up with a plan, a terrible, terrible, terrible plan. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. We've come to chapter 12 of Genesis, one of the most important chapters in the Bible, the beginning of Abraham's great adventure of faith, the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant. In Isaiah 51, verse 1, here's what the prophet says. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Imagine a huge rock quarry, the place where we, we dig out stones. The prophet is comparing our faith to a little rock, a little rock which is dug from a great quarry. The great quarry, the great depository and example of great faith is Abraham. Isaiah 51, 2, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. When he was, when he was one, I called him. Then I blessed him and multiplied him. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Now, Unless we're Jews, we may think that this doesn't have anything to do with us, except for the fact that when you get to Galatians 3, Paul tells us that when we believe in Christ, great Abraham's greater son, we become spiritual children of Abraham. Therefore, a believing Jew has a double blessing. He's a physical child of Abraham and also a spiritual child of Abraham. So, as students of the Word of God and as believing Christians, there would be few more important studies than the study of Abraham, which begins in Genesis chapter 12. Now, we had begun with God's appearance and with God's promise, and we came to the place where there was a famine, and Abram, as he was called in the beginning, went down to Egypt to try to get some sort of relief in getting more food. When he came there, when he arrived there, he believed that his wife's beauty would be a problem. The interesting thing about the Egyptians is that <coughs> they honored marriage more than they honored human life. So they wouldn't take a woman away from her husband, but they might kill the husband so they could take the woman. And that's what Abram feared would happen. So he says, 
in verse 13, Genesis 12, 13, Please say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may live on account of you. Now, technically, they shared one parent, so she was a half-sister. So that was a half-truth, which was also a whole lie, meant to cover up the fact that she was also his wife. When he gets down to Egypt in verse 14, it says that the Egypt, Egyptians did take note of the fact that she was very beautiful, and they reported it to Pharaoh. Evidently, he had an eye for beautiful women, and they knew that maybe they could get, get in good with him by reporting on the arrival of another beautiful woman whom he would like to add to his collection. And so, sure enough, they take Sarai and they reward Abram, her brother, with cattle in exchange for this beautiful sister. It says in verse 17, though, but the Lord struck Pharaoh. The Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. Now, why are we taking so much time on this? We have a lot of material to cover. Why do we linger here a minute and talk about this? There are two reasons. One reason is because this passage magnifies grace. Why is Abram a great man? Because he was always obedient? Because he was perfect and righteous? in all his dealings that he always dealt with integrity? No, because God is a God of great grace. So we magnify grace when we see an episode like this in the life of Abram. We'll talk more about it when we get to chapter 15. Now, there's another reason though. I told you that if, if you go to a university and if you take a course in say comparative religion, you'll be told that the Old Testament is full of fairy tales, that these are fables. These are tales invented by priests to encourage the patriotism of the Jews so they'll be proud to be Jews, so that they'll be more committed to the nation of Israel because of their great history. Now, let me just tell you that most nations do that, including your nation and including my nation. So that's not such an unusual charge that we enhance the qualities of our heroes and we try to cover up their weaknesses. But of course the biblical critics make such a big deal out of this that they say that these stories didn't happen. They were just made up for the purpose of building national pride. They are nation building sagas. Well that's a very interesting theory. It makes me wonder whether the critics have even read the stories or not. Because we have to ask the question, oh really? Why was this story made up? Who was writing the story? Moses. Who was he writing to? Former, who was he writing for? Former Egyptian slaves. Who was the great villain of their entire life? It was Pharaoh, Pharaoh who enslaved them, Pharaoh who would not let them go, Pharaoh who made their lives miserable. So Moses gives them this story at the beginning, at the birth of their nation. Who is the more righteous person in the story, Abram or Pharaoh? It's Pharaoh. How could he have made it up? Why would he have made up a story so embarrassing? Why would he have made up a story so counterproductive if the goal is to build the pride of the nation, if the goal is to show them how wicked was the country they were leaving and how righteous is the nation they are recovering as children of Abraham? You see, my friends, these Bible-hating critics are not only wrong, they're ridiculous. Their theories are absurd. 
absolutely absurd. Just study the evidence. Look at the evidence and approach the Word of God with reverence. Well, I actually see the very same thing happen again in chapter 20. Amazingly, just before Isaac is born, 